Hi everyone, thank you for attending my presentation called eBPF on the Rise. I'm Quentin, I work as a software engineer at Eyes of Alien, and we are doing Cilium, which is built on top of eBPF to bring networking, observability and security to uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, my objective today is to get, help you getting started with eBPF and we'll do that in a uh, three part. The first section will be about uh, understanding how eBPF works and then in a second time we'll see what tools are available for working with eBPF and uh, the last section will be about what benefits we can have for cloud native environments uh, from eBPF. So before we dive into the details, let's observe that there is something happening with eBPF these days. Uh, it's been marked by Liz Rice uh, as one of the key technologies to watch for this year. Uh, but why is that so? What, what's happening with eBPF? Um, to really understand that, let's observe that uh, the Linux system is being used as the basis for everything in uh, cloud environments nowadays. And we have some kind of paradox with Linux uh, because everything that um, allows you to get some observability to understand what resources are used uh, by a given process of pod uh, is happening on the kernel side. But you have very little flexibility at the same time in the kernel. You are free to program whatever you want in user space, but in user space, you won't get a direct access to those uh, kernel data structures. So do we have um, a way to introduce more programmability in the kernel. We have kernel modules, but kernel modules can be uh, tricky to implement or they can have uh, issues in terms of safety. You are likely to uh, uh, crash your kernel if you made some mistakes, some mistakes in your modules. Uh, you do not have any guarantees in terms of uh, API stability from the kernel from one version to the other one. Uh, so that can break your modules too. Uh, so we have those, all those kernel components that are like bounded box uh, in which you can you, you can work with, from which you can um, interact. But can you somehow get out of the box and bring back some programmability into the kernel, uh, not at the expense of safety or efficiency? And if so, can you leverage that to get some benefits in your cloud native environments? The answer, of course, is eBPF. So eBPF is some uh, generic purpose execution engine to uh, really um, implement your programs uh, defined in user space inside of the kernel. So historically, it was built on top of uh, what is now called the classic BPF, which was used with Dispinum or Seccom uh, to filter packets to copy to user space or syscall arguments, uh, respectively. And nowadays, eBPF is using the uh, BPF system call to take some bytecode from user space and to eject it into the kernel where it's executed. Um, it's attached to some specific hooks inside of the kernel and run on specific events. And it has several uh, particularities, one of them being that it's extremely efficient because uh, the bytecode generated maps well to uh, native code on modern architectures. And at the same time, you have a JIT compiler, just-in-time compiler inside of the kernel that turns your eBPF bytecode into native instructions, um, making it really efficient at runtime. You also have uh, uh, benefits in terms of safety because uh, your eBPF program will be checked and verified uh, when you load it into the kernel to make sure that it terminates and won't be hanging your kernel um, and that it is safe. So that means you won't be able to have infinite loops in your programs, uh, but that makes it uh, sure to terminate. And you won't be able to uh, leak some uh, sensitive memory uh, to the user space uh, or to um, perform out of bound accesses in your eBPF program and to risk crashing your kernel. That just won't happen, uh, which is a really strong uh, feature. Um, at the same time, you get something which is really versatile because you have a number of existing program types, like 31 at the moment. Uh, some of them can be attached to different hooks inside of the kernel. Uh, so that means a lot of possible use cases. You have also a number of helper functions that are uh, functions defined in the kernel, which act as some kind of uh, user library uh, functions that can be called from within BPF programs to help you um, perform some specific tasks. Uh, you have a number of maps too. eBPF maps are some uh, kernel uh, memory areas available to programs, uh, usually key value storage um, areas like uh, arrays or hash maps. Uh, a few other ones for dedicated uh, use cases too. 
uh, and those maps can uh, be shared between different instances of a program um, to uh, store some state, for example, some counters, some metrics, whatever. Uh, you can also share them between different programs to correlate some data. You can also share them with uh, user space to share information with user space to uh, collect metrics or to pass down some uh, configuration options. Um, in addition to those features, uh, we get a number of things that the execution engine itself is supporting uh, as the BPF system uh, subsystem is getting improved. So we have now up to 1 million instructions in the program, which makes it um, flexible for a number for a wide number of use cases, even advanced. Uh, we have tail calls, we have eBPF to eBPF function calls, uh, we have bounded loops support now. We have a number of things like this that makes it really closer and closer to um, just a regular program that you would uh, compile from C or from any other language really. It's getting close to uh, something very generic and um, that you can use for all type of usage. So about the use cases, um, they, they mostly fall down into uh, two big categories which are network packet processing on one side and tracing and monitoring on the other side. Uh, as for networking, we have a number of hooks in the kernel. So we have, for example, a hook on the TC traffic control, uh, both ingress and egress path. We have the XDP hook, which is about um, going very low uh, in front of the kernel stack for processing packets just at the exit of the driver. And we can retrieve our pack packets from there and process them uh, even before the circuit buffer is allocated. So even before we spend time and resources uh, processing the packet in the Linux stack. Uh, so that's very efficient uh, in terms of performance here. Um, those hooks make eBPF very suited, very well suited for applications like protection against denial of service attacks uh, or for load balancing to, um, because it's located uh, just in front of the stack. Uh, you have some other applications too, like routing, overlay, NAT, uh, many others. Uh, you can uh, parameter uh, some uh, options for TCP sessions and even re-implement the congestion algorithms used by TCP. Um, so a lot of things on the networking side. Uh, as for the tracing and monitoring, you have a number of hooks on uh, kernel probes and user probes uh, that are dynamic uh, probes that don't need any instrumentation inside of your programs. Uh, you have also uh, static probes with trace points uh, or the user space equivalent and a few other probes too. And you can use them to inspect and trace and profile your kernel uh, or your user space applications, um, making it very suitable for understanding what's going on in terms of resources usage and uh, optimizing your programs too. Um, one big advantage of eBPF is that because it's a program running in your kernel, you can uh, aggregate and correlate metrics and other data inside of your program and just send what you need, the meaningful information to your user application. You don't need to sample out everything uh, to user space and that means a lot of gains uh, in terms of overhead. I mean, you're saving a lot of overhead. Uh, you have a few other use cases too. Um, so for example, you have a Linux security module that is uh, built on top of eBPF now in the kernel. Uh, you have proposals that were made about um, using eBPF for file systems or storage. Uh, so the list is growing. There are more and more people getting interested in BPF and proposing uh, use cases. Um, and that's something that um, is very interesting to see. I'm looking forward to seeing new applications uh, using eBPF. But we have all those use cases. How can we uh, use eBPF uh, concretely to, uh, to start tracing systems, for example, nowadays? Uh, the first tool I would like to present is uh, first the LLVM backend to uh, generate eBPF bytecode. Uh, this bytecode is uh, very close to assembly, but nobody really likes spending their time writing assembly, I think. So we have... Um, the, the Clang and uh, LLC tools uh, that have been adapted to generate uh, eBPF bytecode from C in particular. And so you can just write C programs and turn them into eBPF bytecode that will be stored uh, in ELF files, ELF object files and loaded from there. So here is a very simple eBPF program for networking. Um, it would be attached to uh, an interface and drop everything which is not IPv4 packets.
So this is a standalone program. I can just uh, compile this file with Clang and attach it with the command IPLink set XDP uh, to drop everything which is not IP before. And the way it works is we have two checks in this program. The first one is about uh, using the data and data end pointers uh, pointing to uh, the beginning and end of the packet data respectively to make sure that the packet is uh, big enough so that I can uh, check in it for the uh, prototype field of the Ethernet header and um, otherwise the verifier wouldn't let me uh, do this uh, dereferencing of the Ethernet pointer in the second check um, and if this first check passes then I can just read the prototype field and depending on whether it's IPv4 or not I can uh, drop my packet or let it pass to uh, the Linux stack so that's something really simple but really useful already uh, really powerful already uh, here is something for tracing what we do here is we attach the program to uh, the do sys open function in the kernel and each time some process uh, calls uh, the open system call, uh, we run our program. So what we do in our program is calling a first eBPF helper function to retrieve uh, the PID of the program, uh, realizing the call. And then the second one is just um, dumping a line uh, in some log file uh, containing the name of the program, uh, its PID and its arguments, the file name of the, of the file that's being opened and the flags for opening the file. Um, this is not standalone. This comes with. Uh, this has to be used with BCC, which is a framework for building BPF tools. Uh, so BCC handles compiling the programs with libllvm, and it provides a set of Python wrappers to uh, to help manage BPF objects too. It also contains a number of examples of its own. Uh, so you have a big number of tools and examples coming with uh, BCC. One example is, is uh, OpenSnoop which does just what we did in the previous example. Uh, but in addition to that, it also hooks at the exit of the do sysopen uh, function to uh, retrieve the value returned by the function. And it prints its output to the, to the console. Uh, so we can see just like on this slide, we have the file names and also the names of the process uh, performing the calls and uh, some additional information. Here is another example of BPF tool. Um, sorry, here is another example of BCC tool, uh, which is about uh, profiling CPUs. Um, so we can understand uh, what functions uh, the CPU is spending time on. So the length, horizontal length of the function of the bars on the flame graph uh, presented here is the time spent in uh, every function uh, by the CPU, and the vertical um, boxes represent the call stack of the different functions. Uh, we just need two commands to uh, generate this graph. The first one to run the BCC tool uh, to extract the data uh, from the CPU to, to sample and, uh, the CPU and extract the data. And the second uh, command is just running a script uh, to process its data and generate the graph itself. Uh, so you can use that to profile CPU for uh, your kernel, but also for applications written in a variety of languages. So there is Python, Ruby, PHP, uh, CDAC languages, and so on and so forth. Um, so that makes it really handy to troubleshoot where your CPU is spending some time and to optimize uh, your applications. We have a number of other tools available with BCC2 and uh, this uh, picture is an overview of all the components that can be traced uh, with uh, the existing tools. Uh, they're all open source so you can use uh, any of those already. Um, so just have a look if you're interested in understanding what's going on uh, deep down on your system. Uh, at different uh, parts of your of your system. Another tool uh, which is uh, quite similar to BCC but even easier to use is BPF Trace. Uh, it's built on top of BCC, but the idea is that you just use uh, one-liners or short scripts uh, to run commands. It's like an equivalent to dtrace. Uh, so the first example I have here is about reproducing the uh, tracing of the open system code, uh, but it's just on a one line command, so that's very short. Uh, you have two more examples below about uh, printing the size distribution by process of the length um, written, uh, read by the read system code. So you, uh, you have programs using read and read returns a length of the memory chunk that's being read. And uh, you can just print a histogram in the console with that. Um, the first one is about counting the LLC cache misses uh, for your processes. 
So really, really short comments, but uh, potentially really helpful information to help you troubleshoot your programs. Um, if you want to go beyond BCC and BPF Trace, you can build your own applications. You have libraries to help you with that. Uh, you are not uh, starting from scratch. You have, uh, for example, libbpf, which is uh, the reference library for everything related to libbpf. Uh, it's the reference because it's being updated by the kernel developers each time some new features is being added to the BPF uh, subsystem on Linux. Uh, you have a number of libraries available in Go also. I'm probably a little bit biased here, but I would definitely recommend going with the uh, eBPF library maintained by Cloudflare and Cilium, uh, which is a pure Go library, uh, very useful to, uh, to, to manage eBPF uh, objects. Uh, there are some options in Rust too, and possibly in other languages. Uh, I'm not familiar with everything that's uh, existing on this side. Um, a last tool I would like to mention is not so much about programming with eBPF, but more about uh, managing eBPF objects. I want to be able to understand what's going on in my system, uh, like what programs are loaded, uh, and to inspect them. So there is BPF tool uh, that you can use to load programs with BPF prog load. Uh, from the command line or BPF to proc show to uh, just list uh, the programs that are loaded on your system. So here I have two programs uh, attached to um, sockets and C groups and uh, one XDP program. Uh, I can just dump the bytecode of those programs too uh, to see what's uh, in the program that lo that's loaded on the kernel. Uh, I can dump also the JIT compiled instructions in case it helps. Uh, I can manage maps too, I can uh, list the maps, I can uh, look up for a given entry, I can update a map, um, and I have a few more options available as well. I can uh, test run programs, I can list the eBPF related features supported by my kernel. Um, if you're interested in all those, you should probably have a look at the manual pages for BPF2. And that's it for the tools. Now can we uh, use some of those tools and some of the advantages we've seen about eBPF into cloud native environments. So as a reminder, we have a number of advantages uh, brought forward by eBPF. We have safety, we have performance, we have a uh, big deal in terms of observability. Uh, it's something very versatile. It's in the kernel, but it remains flexible. And having it in the kernel, it's also a huge advantage for other reasons. Uh, in particular because it's available by default. You don't need to install everything uh, to anything uh, to use eBPF. It's already here on your uh, system. Uh, it has a stable user API, so it's not uh, subject to uh, breakages uh, from one kind of version to the next one. Um, it's also really easy to update an eBPF program uh, you don't have to uh, hack into your kernel and then send the contributions uh, upstream and wait for them to uh, be merged and then uh, to be available in your version that you're using. You just change your program and recompile it and reload it. Uh, you no need to reboot your system to load it. And if you're processing packets, for example, you don't even have any loss of packets between an update uh, from the previous to the next program. Um, eBPF is also container where in the sense that it has multiple hooks uh, all over the place in the kernel uh, networking stack or for observability. Um, so you have a lot of possibilities to, uh, to, to process your packets at the entrance or the exit of different clusters uh, and pods. Um, and that makes it really suitable for um, all, all these, uh, these cloud native environments. Um, and one, I think one big thing with eBPF is that you have this possibility to not just uh, program and configure inside of a framework, you can really create what you need, which means uh, you can also uh, leave aside everything uh, in terms of features that you won't be using. Uh, so for uh, networking, if I don't need IPv4, just IPv6, I just don't compile any IPv4 related features. Um, and that gives me something uh, really clean and fast and scalable too uh, that I can use to really implement my solution to solve uh, my real world uh, production use cases. Uh, and that's something really important to have this uh, kind of flexibility, um, especially if we consider that the Linux systems are really everywhere in the cloud um, and used for, for building everything in data centers. 
uh, having eBPF with all this uh, flexibility and all those advantages uh, brings us huge benefits. So how does that translate in practice? Uh, so for example, we have uh, Cube Control Trace, which is already able to run um, BPF Trace scripts uh, on pods and clusters. Uh, so what it does is basically uh, launching a worker pod to just run the command on the node that you want to trace or profile. And you can have BPF Trace uh, one-liners and scripts uh, sending you information about um, your, your system. On the same model, we have Inspector Gadget, which is uh, doing like the same thing really, but for BCC tools. And that's already available open source, so you can use it already. If you were to focus more on networking, uh, Cilium is probably the reference here. Uh, so we do uh, networking and observability and security and all of that with eBPF. So for example, we have a cube proxy replacement. We can get rid of cube proxy, which is a huge advantage because cube proxy heavily relies on IP tables rules. And those rules uh, may come by the thousands. Um, and typically, when you get a packet to process, you would uh, search for the re relevant rules in your tables in a linear way. And that takes a lot of time and resources. And with eBPF, we just have to do one lookup in a hash map table. So you just uh, retrieve a tuple uh, to identify what flow uh, your packet belongs to. And then you realize one hash map lookup uh, to get the relevant rule. And that's it. And because of the hooks available, for example, on TC, uh, you can actually do most of the processing on your packet in eBPF and bypass all of those IP tables hooks um, that are otherwise present in the stack. Uh, so that leads to huge uh, gains in terms of performance um, and makes things a lot cleaner too. Another example uh, of Cilium's optimized data path is when we use uh, an Envoy proxy to implement a layer 7 policy. So if I want to tell uh, this pod, um, the system that this pod can use this HTTP REST API command in particular, but not this pod, this one doesn't have the permission. So I have uh, this Envoy proxy injected as a sidecar into uh, the pod, and I have um, to, to uh, go through the Linux tag three times to implement that. Uh, once to get to the loopback interface and I go back to the proxy and then I go down again to exit the pod and same thing on the destination pod. And with eBPF, we can just avoid most of that. We can just establish a connection at the socket level uh, directly to the proxy. And we also get rid of the IP tables hooks uh, on our way down to the network. Uh, so that again leads to, uh, to, uh, to important gains in terms of performance. Uh, we also have a number of other use cases for eBPF, for networking, load balancing, network security, observability, and service mesh. Uh, but I won't have time to uh, dive into all of them. So just have a look at uh, Cinium's documentation or uh, join our community Slack if you're interested to, uh, to discussing them further. Uh, let's move on with uh, the big eBPF players uh, that are actually contributing to or using BPF. Uh, there is Facebook using it a lot for tracing and monitoring and for network processing. They have uh, um, an open source uh, load balancer in particular called Catron that you can find on GitHub. Uh, Netflix is using eBPF2 for tracing monitoring mostly. Uh, Google for number of use cases too. Uh, Cloudflare mostly for protection against denial of service attacks. And of course everywhere uh, Cilium is deployed, uh, eBPF is used a lot to implement the data path and the network policies. Uh, there are also a number of other projects using eBPF. So for example, we have Falco or Tracy using eBPF for security purposes in the cloud. We have Hubble, which um, already implements unprecedented visibility for network flows uh, on your clusters. Uh, we have Weaveworks. Uh, Suricata 2 has uh, some XDP uh, mode for capturing packets for security purposes. So eBPF is a thriving ecosystem, really. There are an increasing number of projects in addition to those I presented uh, using the technology. Uh, this leads also to some new startups productizing eBPF for continuous profiling, network analytics for security in the cloud too. And some of those startups have been acquired already. So I think that was late, late last year. We've had uh, Pixie acquired by uh, New Relic also flow mill acquired by Splunk. And that shows that there is some interest into those products, into the technology itself, um, and that there is a lot of momentum here. On the kernel side, on the community side, we've had a dedicated mailing list for eBPF contributions 
uh, which received about uh, which has been receiving about uh, 50 emails uh, per day on average and we also have um, free maintenance five senior uh, code reviewers to keep up with the load and they come from Facebook eyes of Aiden and Google um, and all that makes eBPF one of the fastest growing subsystem uh, in Linux at the moment uh, there's a lot going on we've had our first uh, eBPF summit uh, late last year uh, organized by the Cilium community and it was a huge success uh, if you want to see the videos have a look uh, on YouTube they're all available um, two tweets that I would like to present uh, to show also the momentum that uh, is going on with eBPF the first one from uh, Mark Rusinovich is about uh, Microsoft looking at implementing some uh, Sysmon like a utility for uh, tracing on Linux um, and that sounds very interesting to, to see Microsoft focusing on eBPF uh, to implement things. The second one is from Stephen Rosted about BPF that may replace Linux in the future so um, more seriously there are a number of people that envision that uh, more and more parts of the kernel might rely on eBPF in the future because of the performance and the safety guarantees uh, that it brings uh, to, to avoid all kinds of uh, security issues and to gain some flexibility uh, for uh, all kinds of processing. So to wrap up this presentation, eBPF brings a lot of, program of programmability to the kernel. It's safe, efficient, uh, it's versatile, it's scalable. Uh, it's ideally located to gather data about what's going on on resources usage, on uh, the different calls that the pods are uh, executing on the system and also for processing packets. Uh, all of these for individual systems or in cloud native environments. Um, and uh, we have a number of tools already that are being improved uh, by the day to work with um, eBPF. So we have uh, BCC eBPF trace if you want already to use some tools to uh, trace and monitor some of your applications. Uh, we have libraries like libbpf and go libraries uh, to help you program your own applications using eBPF programs. Uh, we have uh, tools like BPF2 to help with uh, introspection and uh, management of eBPF objects. Uh, all of these open source and already available. Uh, eBPF is on the rise, so uh, it solves uh, real world production problems and that's something really important. And a lot of big companies are using it for that uh, because it brings them the flexibility they need to, uh, to change some behavior in the kernel right now without having to wait for upstream uh, changes. Um, so Cilium's optimized data path and network policies is a very good example on how you can leverage eBPF to, uh, to implement uh, advanced, advanced features uh, in cloud native um, environments. Uh, and there is a buzzing community behind BPF to, uh, to add new tools, new features uh, all the time. So um, I hope you'll be able to, uh, to join the community and to ride the eBPF wave. So that's it for this presentation. Thank you for attending. If you need more information, uh, there's one link in particular that you should check, which is ebpf.io uh, and which contains in particular all the pointers uh, that you would need if you uh, wanted to uh, get um, more information and documentation uh, about the ebpf use cases uh, and internals themselves. So uh, have a look at this website. And again, thank you for uh, watching my presentation today.